Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, my name is John DeLynn. Uh, it is January 8th, right? 10th. 10th, 2018. January 10th, 2018. Uh, it's a Friday night. We've done five, six hours with the Whitbecks, and we just had dinner, and we're here to finish our uh, interview with uh, Dave, Carey, and Alyssa Whitbeck. Um, so for those of you who are bored on a Friday night or, or super fans of Mormon Stories podcast <laughs> and who are going to be joining us for the, the close of this interview, we just spent uh, five hours interviewing the Whitbecks. It's an epic story. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, suffice, to, suffice it to say it uh, was really powerful and important. And uh, you should all go back and listen if you haven't yet. But where we left off, uh, uh, Dave and Carrie, who are here with us, uh, went back. They had lost their faith in the church. Um, and as a, as a parting act of karma, um, they were able to go to San Diego to watch their daughter, Alyssa, um, or actually to stand outside the temple as their daughter, Alyssa, got married to Cade um, in the San Diego temple. Is that right? So that's where we, that's where we left off. And, and I think as you guys were driving away on the honeymoon, you, uh, Alyssa, said that you said something to Cade. Can you remind us what you said? Yeah. Um, so we'd had the sealer make some commentary that we didn't love. And I said, so you don't actually believe that stuff, right? <laughs> Which is probably a little bit uh, anticlimactic coming straight from the wedding. But, yeah. And so, but also it, it seemed like you were basically starting to have serious doubts uh, by, the, by the wedding, mm -hmm. by, by the end of the, the temple wedding. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's pick up there and just tell us um, – kind of how things progressed, knowing that your parents were kind of seriously, apparently done with the church, but you and your sister, you know, at that point were still in, how did, how did things evolve for you guys? Yeah. So it was kind of back and forth. I felt like after the divorce, I realized some toxic elements of the church. And so I thought the church is 100% true, but maybe it's not all the way good. Um, and then when I started learning about some feminism and things like that, I thought, hmm, maybe the church isn't all the way true, um, but maybe it's good. And so I just kind of flipped my ideas. And so after the wedding, I was starting to have a little bit more doubts about the truthfulness, but was trying to hold on to the goodness of the church that I was trying to really hold on to, to something there. And so after this... Um, I was, I was just really thrown off by the sealer, and I think that kind of just led me into a three, free fall of the rabbit hole of, you know, history and podcasts and all of all of the good things that that happen with the faith crisis. Let me let me ask you kind of a hard, a bit of a hard question. It's really not a fair question, <laughs> but I think it's it's the it's the way many thoughtful, uh, you know, Mormons who question or doubt or leave the church, especially in a parental kind of authority role, you would maybe, if you're just thinking purely logically, you would think parents are smart, parents are experienced, parents are loving, parents have really taken care of you. They leave the church. It's pretty easy. You go, oh my gosh, why are you leaving? Uh, I want to learn everything that you've learned and I'm leaving too if you're leaving. But it wasn't that easy for you. And I think we all know why. But I just want to hear you articulate why it wasn't that easy for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, at this point, I wasn't – my testimony wasn't because of my parents. It was something that I had built on my own. And so I thought that they just got it wrong this time. And I'd had my own spiritual experiences confirmed that the church was true. And so, yikes, parents might not be as perfect as I once thought that they were. So it was that simple. Yeah. So you had your own testimony you had to deconstruct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how did it deconstruct? <laughs> <laughs> what was the process? Yeah. Um, so it really started, it started with trying to find answers to some like questions of, you know, temple things, feminism things, and a few of the basic history things like multiple accounts of the first vision, polygamy. And I don't mean simple as in simple, but the first things that I guess a lot of people learn in a faith crisis 
and we would go to church, Kate and I, um, after we were married, and we'd go to sacrament meeting, and we'd go to Sunday school, and I felt like they never addressed anything that I was worried about, so I'd sit there for, you know, the length of church and not feel like anything that really mattered was being discussed. And so eventually it kind of turned into we would just go to sacrament meeting and then I would spend a couple of hours doing my own study. I would be reading general conference talks and scriptures and praying and all of these things to try to find answers to the hard questions, the deep doctrinal questions, but I never seemed to find anything. Um, And... But it sounds like you didn't. Um, it sounds like you didn't kind of run to your parents and say, "Hey guys, okay, I'm going to start uh, questioning too, and I just want to let you know." It sounds like you didn't take that approach. No. Well, you, and, and again, if we're just thinking logically, you think that's what you do. You just run to your parents and say, "Now I'm questioning. Tell me everything. It, just spell it out first why that wasn't your approach." Yeah. Well, I think I. <laughs> I was still under the impression that there was some answer there that I would find. Um, and I knew that my parents were all the way out. And so I thought maybe the church isn't true and maybe it's not good, but it has to be at least something positive. And so I want to I want to make it stay. So I want to talk to people that are staying, not talk to people that have left. So they had lost some credibility. Uh-huh, yeah. Isn't that kind of weird? Can I interject yeah. a little yeah. something? Yeah. We intentionally didn't tell the, the kids anything. Um, I, I think we were taking the approach of we want them to have take their own path. Um, I didn't want to sit down and tell the the girls everything that we found that was wrong with the church. Um, we fact, probably we, almost we, did that to a fault because Kendall actually one time said, "Stop pushing me to go to church." <laughs> like I think we just overcompensated on our fear of. What wanting, was your theory behind that? I think we just didn't want to be. We wanted them to have their own journey and not do something they'd regret later because of us. Did you appreciate that, Alyssa? Yeah, I did, definitely. At first, I I think they definitely took it more so. (laughs) What do you mean? Well, by the time I actually was questioning, and this is jumping forward a few months, but... We can wait. We can wait then. Okay. Okay, We'll get there in a minute. Okay. But you're you're glad they gave you space. Mm -hmm. Yep. At this point, I was glad they were giving me space. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm just going to say from someone who's been at this for a while... If you push people, you create what's called the backfire effect, which means they hold tighter to their beliefs. They have a reaction where they maybe even become more zealots or more strong in their beliefs if you push. So if you are a doubter or a non-believer and you're trying to figure out what to do with your believing family, the answer is not to push, not to prod, not to poke, but just to find a way to process your stuff and to let them have their journey if you want to have the best chance of a good outcome. (laughs) Is that okay to say? As a parent of daughters, that's hard though, because especially with all the patriarchal stuff I already saw her go through, I was like, you really want to be like, give her all the reason in the world to question that and to not not have blind faith. And yeah, but it's still ultimately, I don't want to resent me. Yeah. So, so you wanted, you, you didn't really trust them as much and you wanted to talk to faithful people. Mm -hmm. Yep. So who'd you talk to? Um, I talked to lots of friends, family. I didn't tell them that I was questioning, just asked a lot of people about their testimonies, basically. I listened to Gina Colvin's podcast. A Thoughtful Faith? Mm-hmm. That's an Open Stories Foundation didn't know production. That. Probably wouldn't have listened to it at the time. Oops. Yeah, but that was really helpful because it was, you know, had a little bit more of a thoughtful spin and I listened to um Isn't Gina great? She's, she's awesome. fantastic. I she's love so Gina. intelligent and witty and strong. She is. Yeah. Mormon Matters. That's Dan Witherspoon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I listened to that a bit. That's us too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I started Mormon Matters. Um, cool. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I was doing I was doing some of those, reading the essays, you know, all of these um just slightly more safe things. And I was talking with Cade, and Cade was a little bit hesitant. And so the first part of our marriage, he was, we were on a little bit of different pages with that. I was leaning more toward out, and he was leaning more toward in, which was, you know, that's hard right off the bat. But but then. Um, he was leaning more out? More in. I was okay, leaning okay, out, okay, and he was okay, leaning in. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. And so he, I mean, he had had questions growing up and things, um, but. But not 
the same that I was at this point. I was definitely a lot more into studying at this point than he was. And um, there was a time where I was like, maybe I'll give Mormon Stories a try. And then I tried listening to Amy McPhee's All podcast. Best, yeah, because yeah, I read her essay. And then I started listening to it, and I just was on a run, and I started crying. And I was like, oh, no. Once I start down the Mormon stories path, like, <laughs> that all That's hell will break loose. And so I turned it off, and I found a talk from um, Elder Holland that I was listening to. But I found that there weren't topics addressed by church leadership that was really addressing what I was concerned about. And so even no matter how many times I was Googling all of these things, trying to find topics, the only places that they were talking about these issues was in the um, quote-unquote anti-Mormon area. And yeah. so that was yeah. really frustrating at the time. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So then um, President Monson dies. And President Nelson is put in. And this was a really hard transition for Cade because Revelation was a question that he had. And he learned about how the president of the church is chosen. And it's based on like seniority rather than Jesus coming into the temple and crowning <laughs> a new prophet. And so he was really flustered about that. And so that kind of started his own faith crisis. And so at this point, this is, I don't know, February maybe. So this is kind of... We were married in December. By February, we're both kind of on our own faith crises with different things or different um, trajectories and different problems, but still. This is last year, right? Bit. A year ago? Two years ago. Oh. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, yeah, two years ago. I just, remember, I just remembered the other thing that happened in the temple, other oh. than the sealer with you that made awesome. you question them with your name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty important oh, yeah. to hurry quickly. Okay, really quick backstory. Um, yeah, and this, this was another thing that kind of started the questioning. So right. I was in the temple for the wedding back in December of 2017, and I have to tell Cade um, what my new name is, right? So that way he knows how to call me through. Because <laughs> if he says Alyssa, no one's going to come. <laughs> and anyway, and so I'm sitting there, and I tell the person the name, and the temple worker gets really, really flustered. He's like, that's not the name. Um, because he thought that I was going through that day for my endowment, but I'd had my endowment taken out, you know, a couple of years before. And so he kind of threw a fit about um, how I was saying the wrong name. And I was like, no, I remember. I was told that if I forget, like, that's a really big deal. I remember. And um, he went and talked to some people trying to figure out, you know, if I was saying the wrong name or not. And at this point, I was kind of like, I don't even care. Just call me whatever you want. And that was the closest um, oh my gosh. Yeah. to like showing that maybe I didn't quite believe it if I was willing to have him call me some random name instead of my actual temple <laughs> Do what you got to do, just right? whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but eventually <laughs> they yeah. realized that I had was actually not getting my endowment out that day. And that's when I realized how, you know, everybody on the same day gets the same name. And that was really shocking and because you want to, you want to think it's super personal. You want to like, feel, yeah. You want Heavenly feel like Father's yes. giving me my personal name, it's like exactly. and then you find out it's like, okay, what's the day? Okay, <laughs> yes. you're you're Susie, you know. Yeah, exactly. You're Eve, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Just those. Yeah. So that was kind of kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, Humbling. Yeah. So, so Kate and I were going through our own different faith crises, but we're trying to um, have balance, is how we put it. And so we're like, well, maybe it's not all the way true, but maybe it's partially true is kind of where we were at. And so um, starting in March, we started like drinking coffee and we drink coffee in the morning and then we go to church and <laughs> then we, you know, and that was kind of our way of trying to be soft and also be involved. And, and so they're trying to be as gray as possible because we'd had such a binary perspective for so long. So we were trying to be uh, more balanced, I guess, but that didn't really work either. And so we tried that for a while, but but by this by the time the summer came, we both had studied enough and learned enough that we realized that we couldn't keep it up anymore. So. So what'd you do? So we. What about your sister? Yeah. So my sister is still very very in, and I had promised my sister that when she went through the temple, I would be there with her because she saw me panic at the temple and then she saw her parents leave and she's freaked out because she hasn't been through any of this and doesn't know what the problems are. 
And I told her, I promise you that when you go through the temple, I will be able to go through the temple with you and I'll make it not scary. And so I was felt really, and so I took a long time before I would take my garments off because I thought that shows that I can't go in the temple. Even though coffee, you're not supposed to go in the temple either. Um, but I thought that as long as I could keep wearing them, maybe then when Kendall would go through the temple that I could be with her. Um, and so this was really propelling me for a while. But Kendall apparently had actually started having her own questions, but she didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And so... We all had just... Mm -hmm, the same, yeah. We end up in the same place. We all had very independent journeys. Mm -hmm. It's kind of yeah. interesting. You know an organization is unhealthy if children can't talk to their parents about something really important or if parents can't talk to their children or if siblings can't talk to each other. And it's just one of the most dumbfounding, frustrating, scary parts about the Mormon experience is that, you know, number one is how hard it is sometimes for just regular Mormon families to be open and honest and talk to each other. In your case, you guys had probably close to an idyllic Mormon family in the, in, in the sense of your ability to be honest and open and talk to each other about everything. And that started with your relationship, you know, and yet in spite of having all that ability, once the most important things are happening, you're not able to really talk to anyone in your family about it. You're scared to tell your sister. You're scared to talk to your parents. You don't trust your parents. You don't feel good about it. Like what kind of organization makes it so family members just can't be honest with each other? It's, it's like the number one thing is that you're all the same, that you're all doing the same thing, not that you're all doing good things and happy and whatever. It's that we're all, I remember Christine Clark in her interview saying that Everyone, you know, after testimony meeting, it was the high five, high five, high five. Like, we're all in the same. We're all confirmed. We're all the same. Okay, good. Now we can. That seems to be, at least in my experience, really important in Mormonism. Yeah. That everyone has to be on the same page. It's, it's kind of, it's just all about agreement. Yeah. Right? It's all about reaffirming each other's pre-existing beliefs. Right. So, um, so you guys hit that, you guys hit that summer and you're not able to, to stay. Mm -hmm. So how did you break the news to everybody, or how did how did it how did it yeah. progress? Well, I, I started um, probably towards <clears throat> the end of spring, talking with my mom and my dad a bit about kind of like my thoughts and things. Um, and and this is at the point where they're both starting to play the devil's advocate, and they're trying to tell us all the positive things about the church, especially my dad. <laughs> he um, was almost acting like he wanted us to stay Mormon, which was very sweet. Um, but he was very much. It's like, actually smart. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, proposing all the positives and well, what about this and what about this and what about this and so. Um, At least we know that you had well thought out and you true. didn't just, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And so I think at that point, it took a while before I told Kendall, um, but I kind of softly told my parents over the span of maybe a month or two, and and every conversation I was like, yeah, you know, I think. It's getting more difficult to go, and the belief is kind of, you know, it's barely hanging on. And then, so then by the time that it was off completely, they they were, you know, it wasn't shocking <laughs> at that point. Um, she prepared us. I prepared you, yes. And what and, and what were you guys saying to each other as you hear the cracks are starting to form? What were you <laughs> saying to each other? Dave was a little worried. Because, again, like you said, he just was so worried about influencing them the wrong way. But was it, wasn't there a part of you that's like, woohoo, yeah, yes. they're coming with I, us. I, yeah, and, <laughs> and eventually I think he got there. But I, when we left and we had the whole kite discussion, <laughs> we, I mean, it took us a long time to say anything because we literally thought, okay, this is, we're going to be the bad grandparents. We're going to be the par grandparents that our kids feel like they have to shield their kids from. We're never going to be part of baby blessings and baptisms and we're going to be the kind of othered and we just knew that was our future and it was we didn't want to go there so we just kind of avoided it and just tried to until we you know finally told them but so then to see that it wasn't going to be like that that maybe you know that was it was it was I was sad for her because I knew the road that was ahead of her it's hard to it's hard it, it's a, it's painful to lose your faith yeah, you and wouldn't I, wish it on people, And I don't, right? we didn't yeah. want her to go through that, but I also knew, for me, at the end, how, how, um, but much better I felt and how much more I felt like 
just less judgmental. I felt like suddenly my mind was, I wanted to learn from other people instead of feeling like I had something to offer them. Like we go to different countries and different <clears throat> cultures, and I'm like, I want to learn from you. Like you tell me what you have rather than me thinking I have a thing to give you. So that was really, that felt really good to me, and I, I loved that feeling, and I was excited for them to feel and not feel pushed down by patriarchy or to feel like they had to somehow make things like marry, like Joseph Smith marrying a 14-year-old girl fit, somehow make that okay. Like, you don't have to make that okay. It wasn't okay. And, and that's, you know, I was happy that they could think that way and they didn't have to try to make yucky things good. And I don't want to project or implant something that's not true, but when I think about, you know, your mom passing to you kind of, or you, you assuming the, the role of kind of submission within the patriarchy, mm -hmm. and then you having to experience your daughters submit to the patriarchy, and then you have to think about, wow, will their children, yeah. you know, will, will it just, will it just keep Going. getting passed mm -hmm. down from generation to generation? Yeah. Because of, because of those feelings about patriarchy, it's got to feel good to, it must have felt good to consider the fact that maybe the the oh, yeah. chain would stop and oh, break, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was that was huge for me. And to see Lissa have her feminist awakening was just fantastic for me. I just loved that the, so much. It was after everything she'd been through. I was just. <laughs> it's like it stops now. Yes. it stops with our generations exactly. down. Exactly. Yeah, she's a strong girl. So mm. yeah. Okay. Okay. It was a little scary. Um, I wanted to support Alyssa in whatever she wanted to do. Um, you know, on the one hand, if she's in the church, it, it feels like the known path, the safe path. I mean, safe in a way. I mean, obviously, we've talked about a lot of things that, that weren't safe for her. But it's, it's the one that I was the most familiar with. And so if she stayed in the, the church and she chose to stay in the church, I would have been okay with it. Um, however... You know, there's 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 pros and cons, and so I just, you know, I didn't really try to push her one way or the other on that. Um, you know, I just wanted her to make her decisions based on her experiences and her journey, and and uh, um, so I didn't have any strong feelings. You know, because like I say, I, I can see the pros and cons both ways. But, but we did learn that there isn't just one sure fire path that's going to lead. To we right. did everything right. Alyssa did everything right. They went exactly the way the church told us to do it. So we knew that that wasn't a just guaranteed road to happiness. So we knew that that taught me anyway. You have to some that for some people that works, and for other people you have to find your own path. So yeah, oddly enough, after I got excommunicated, I was hoping my kids would stay in the church because I still had this Mormon wiring. Yeah this priesthood wiring that kids won't be healthy and happy outside the church. They won't yeah. be, like we said, they'll become drug addicts and prostitutes and <laughs> they'll lose their way and they won't have any morals. And so I, I, I've experienced this weird sadness when Margie resigned and then the kids started dropping out because we did the same thing. We didn't push them out. We were yeah. like, it's your journey, whatever you guys want. And they tried to keep going for a while, but it didn't last. So, But anyway, I relate to that feeling like, Make your own decision because I'm not sure you're going to be okay outside. Yeah. How did you guys acquire the confidence that – because you were pretty new. How did you guys acquire the confidence that your, you and your kids and your family could be okay without the church? I think I just felt – for me personally – I mean, I know my journey is different than Dave's, but I felt like I – I recognized myself again. You lived it. Weird. You live. You grew up without the church. Yeah. And your mom's awesome. And so I like try, exactly. Your and I just felt like, but for, <clears throat> but I really, really believed it was true. And so, so I needed to fit into this box that I didn't really naturally fit in. So I felt like I. There were parts of it that fit me well, but there were parts that really didn't. And I felt like I was just always stuffing myself in this box that didn't really work and so it was so it for me it was just like this load off that I'm like I remember I mean this is so cheesy but I remember just seriously looking in the mirror and being like I I there you are like I haven't seen you in a long I mean I seriously felt like I don't have to be I could just be me again 
And for, so for me, it was... It's like coming home. Yeah. So I felt like it was just, it was liberating for me. Mm. So. How about you, Dave? <clears throat> um, for me, the church had to be true for me to stay in. Um, mm. I spent an incredible amount of time and effort trying to figure out, you know, whether the church was true or not. And um, I found an overwhelming amount of evidence that led me away from the church. And, uh, you know, it kind of goes back to the integrity thing that we've been talking about or that we've talked about. You know, I have to feel like I, I can't, I, I think I would feel like I was living a lie if I stayed in the church. Yeah. And I couldn't do that. So stepping outside, um, you know, whether, you know, it was an unknown, but it was what I felt like I had to do. There so. was no option. Right. That engineering brain yeah. does not compute. Yep. Exactly. It's not structurally sound. Yep. <laughs> so. So you, you said, but what about disappointing parents and siblings? and? Um, that was a major factor in, you know, where I've been. Um, I feel like I'm probably disappointing my mother. Um, she, she's very, she's, she's a great person and she, she likes to put on a strong front and tell me that, um, that she's not disappointed in me, but I think the church doesn't really offer her any option. I mean, she wants her, her family is the most important thing in the world to her. And with that being the case, um, if she has kids that are that leave the church or people that you know the church says that you have to be in the church to have a forever family so but i just felt like i had to do what i had to do hmm. as far as siblings go um you know i haven't really had any conversations with any of them as far as exactly where i'm at i've 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 opened the door. Um, I've mentioned things. They they know that uh, you know that there's we're not gunning for bishop or really society president or anything. Uh, you know they they know we haven't been attending, and that's you know they haven't really asked any questions as to what to why or how far we're, we've gone or, um, and so I've just decided that if they want to talk, I'll be happy to talk to them. And like I say, I've, I've kind of presented some opportunities here and there, but um, it hasn't gone very far, and that's okay. <laughs> Most don't want to know. Yeah. Right? And they don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how did you – what about Kendall? How did you guys finish it off? And then was there some culminating sort of like cinematic sort of coming together where it's like, we're all out? You know, Gosh. how did that – she, um, let's see, that would have been the <coughs> summer, the summer she graduated, the summer, um, 18? So let's see, she graduated in 17, so it was before you got married. I was thinking it was, anyway, so I guess it was the year after, so it was right when you were starting your little crisis, she came to me and okay. said, she, she came to me and said, um, I think I should consider whether or not I should go on a mission. And so we're all like, whoa, because... Listen, Kate are starting their crisis, and we're pretty well through our crisis, but Kendall been holding on. And she said, I'm not saying I'm going to go, but I basically girls, a lot of girls are going now. I should probably decide whether I'm going to go or not. And so, and we talked about it, and I asked her if after a few days, it was like, well, do you actually want to share the gospel, or are you feeling like you're 19 and you want to get out a little bit and kind of spread your wings and... She's like, yeah, more of that. <laughs> I think it was both. I think she wanted think, to help people. Yeah, I she did. She That's wanted, true. She did. Yeah. So we came up with a, she went, did a humanitarian trip to Thailand. And I said, do that. And then we'll see how you feel after, you know, if you. Best so. money you ever spent. <laughs> <laughs> and she came back and had just an amazing experience and just said, I met all these people from all over the world and not one of them was Mormon. And they were all so good. And that just kind of opened her mind to goodness all you know in lots of places and 
so that was kind of the beginning for her. And then honestly, um, she didn't do like podcasts or research really at first. She just um, started having a hard time in her student ward. Like she listened to the Renlands devotional and that really stressed her out, the whole how they vilified people who have questions in the church and that really upset her. And she was just watching a devotional. She was just trying to be, you know, active and that really had the opposite effect on her. Um, and then she's just kind of gradually Kendall, away to, yeah. go ahead. Kendall's just an extremely thoughtful um, person who's really aware of like the humanity in people. And I think that was something that had always been hard for her in the church of like social issues and mm -hmm. you know, members of the LGBTQ community and things like this. And so I think yeah. um, some people leave for history, some people leave for other things. And Kendall has such a big heart. And I think she, I mean, I don't want to speak for Kendall, but, but I do know that part of it was she felt like she couldn't love everybody yeah. equally in the position that she was in. And she, you know, that was her life goal is to help people and be kind to people. And she felt like she couldn't do it there. With no judgment or any of that. And yeah. And it was painful. It was. Yeah. But, yeah. So was there that, was there that moment where like you all come together and say, we're all out, <laughs> you know? Not really. No. I mean, it was all just so gradual. But now we've had, there's been a few times we've been in the middle of a conversation and we've stopped and said, wow, it's really nice that we can just talk about this church stuff and we don't have to f filter for anybody or be. So we've had a couple of those moments. We're like, wow, this is really nice that we can talk about this. Yeah, we've, we've done like Sunday morning uh, coffee shops. Yeah, we have done that a couple of times. Been, that's been fun. That's been. We've been like, hey, we're, like, we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> but. But I think it was yeah. gradual enough for everybody that there yeah. wasn't a moment that we all realized at the same time that we were all mm -hmm. in a similar place. Right. So, um, so I guess, I mean, is that a happy ending? Is it a it happy, is. is it not a happy ending? What is it? I think it's I a think very it happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> for you guys, it's a happy ending. So maybe I'll just ask a couple more questions then. Uh, um, do you miss, is there anything you miss about, uh, being in the church? I miss, um, everyone thinking I'm on the right path. Kendall just texted, yay, we're all out. Hi, Kendall. Hi, Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, I mentioned at the beginning that I bore my testimony and everybody told me how awesome I was, but not that yeah. many people are like, man, you're so awesome. Nobody yeah, gives you accolades for now. just being... <laughs> you know, people are like... Your award didn't come celebrate with you? Nobody, yeah. I'm like, okay. I said I liked it. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, the accolades are yeah. a thing, especially for And there's so many checkboxes that I don't have, and it's healthier out, but sometimes it's like, man, I like I like the checkboxes sometimes. So the structure, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Both a good thing to leave and a painful thing to leave. Do you miss the community at all? Kind of. I always felt a little bit like I didn't quite fit in. So, I mean, I had fr friends, I have people I absolutely loved, but I always felt like the relationship just kind of was about to this level and it just kind of stayed there. G wonderful people, loved them to death, but I never felt like... It was really my, like, I really belonged. So I always felt a little bit a little bit out of it anyway. I mean, I didn't quite fit. I felt the same way. I felt like, you know, you look around at different ward members and feel like um, they're in a little bit different spiritual plane than you are. Now, I don't want to give the wrong impression because I think, and when I look back, that I, I think I was probably a, a lot more spiritual than than what I was giving myself credit for at the time. I think that I had, you know, I was, I was doing, um, I was living the gospel, but still when you compare yourself with the other people, you know, you always feel like other people are, there's always people that you feel like you're doing better at different things. One of the things that, uh, that I noticed about myself was that when we were, I felt like a lot of the time um, 
over the last 25 years, you know, I was working on building businesses or building our business and, and uh, school and different things. And so I was pretty busy and I was a little bit uh, introverted. Um, I felt like, I, I mean, I would do all the, the callings that I was given, but sometimes I'd kind of try to fly into the radar a little bit. Because it felt like every time I got to know somebody new, I'd get a new calling. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be put in with that person for whatever. And so it's like, I'm just going to quit meeting people because I, I, I need to focus on my other stuff. And so, I mean, that wasn't, you know, that was, that was my fault. But I'm just saying that uh, sometimes it felt like when I got involved with the community, it just got, it just made my time busier and busier. Um, and that, that probably sounds bad because I, 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 I'm a big advocate for service. I love serving people, but uh, you know, if you feel like, um, you know, if you're if you do too much, you're going to get sucked in. It just you get sucked in further and further. I mean, I was kind of on that trajectory for a while. Um, you know, I was I was called into the bishop brick, but I felt like uh, that didn't really represent where I was at, so I didn't do it. It was one of the very few callings I ever turned down, but I just felt like, no, that's, that's, I'm just not comfortable going there. Now I look back and think maybe if I would have done that, um, you know, I probably would have just kept moving up and maybe I'd have more Mormon cred right now. Um, but it didn't feel like it was. He's always it. very integrous. I mean, he always just, he doesn't feel like he's not doing it. So that's a good thing. Yeah. So, um, some of the things people miss, some people miss the identity, some people miss the sense of meaning and purpose, some people miss community, some people lose friends, some people um, miss the certainty about the afterlife or resolutions about death, um, some people get confused around morality, some people miss the spirituality and the sense of connection, the opportunities to serve you talked about. Anything else you guys want to say about like, if there's anything you miss, I'm not trying to fish for that. I right. just want to right. make sure. I, I mean, I definitely liked the idea that I had it all figured out. The certainty. Uh, and the certainty. I liked the idea that I knew that, uh, I mean, I love my family. I want to be with them forever. And, uh, you know, the church offers this, this um, opportunity for me to be with my family forever. And, and you know, if, you know, and... A lot of ways, I'm, I wish, in in a lot of ways, I wish the church were true. That I, the church that I knew was true. Um, you know, the church that I knew didn't have polygamy. It didn't have, or you know, Joseph Smith wasn't a polygamist, and the, and and some of the the issues that I'm aware of now didn't exist. You like the whitewashed church, <laughs> the, the, the one where the polygamy version. was used to get across the plains, and that's it. And that was the only yeah. reason. Yeah, yeah, that's and that was the church that I knew, and and, yeah. and that church was great. Mm. I miss the certainty, but I also really embrace. I've I've learned the last little while to really embrace not knowing. It's kind of. I mean, this is maybe my hippie, my mom coming out, but I I like the idea of maybe there's something that. I, it's something I haven't even thought of yet. Who knows what the afterlife is? Maybe there is one, maybe there isn't one, but it's kind of comforting to me to not know and to not feel like I have this unimaginable thing to live up to my whole life to get there. It's just, I don't know, we'll see, you know? A lot of people, they're not, I mean, I, that's how I feel. It's like, who knows? Yeah. No, no, no one can know. So if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Right. right. I do on, know I have right now, so yeah. Yeah, and that's that comes out of Buddhism and yeah. mindfulness and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But there are there are some people that get panicky. It's like, wait, what happens when we die? Now I don't know. Why am I even here? Life is painful. Uh, there's no point. If there's no point in this life, I don't want to be here. You know, yeah. they get really. You guys, don't, that's not how you guys. No, felt. None of you. Okay. Um. So to. Any, anyone else have responses to those things about what you miss or you're good? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the questions I like to ask is kind of what was hard, hardest about the transition. I mean, this was a very long transition. And in the end, you were all kind of out. And so 
maybe some of those hard things like being in a mixed faith marriage or disappointing your parents or being ostracized from your kids, that kind of all got resolved. So is there anything you, that you haven't already talked about, about the hard parts about the transition or, or do we pretty much already cover that? The hardest part for me was just hurting my, my family. Yeah. Just the thought that I, you know, and we've covered that, but. Okay. Yeah, I think we've covered And I, I think, um, for me, it was it was hard to feel like I was disappointing people. And even though I wasn't disappointing my immediate family, there was still, I mean, all of my extended family on my dad's side is in. And so I felt like I was disappointing them. And, you know, same with Kate's family. And that's, I don't like to feel like I'm disappointing anybody. Um, and friends, I never really lost friends, but, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, but I have worried about that, and I think I haven't really had a lot of conversations with friends about it, and so that was kind of stressful, was feeling like I was going through something really big that I was talking about with only a select few people, and so that was that was hard. One thing that's been hard now is, for me, is I look back and think, I spent so many years making sense of things that didn't make sense, um... <laughs> And now that I know <laughs> the truth, it feels like I feel kind of like I like I sold my soul, and and it wasn't even real. Does that makes it's it's kind of a weird feeling. And so like when the when the leaders um, do things like um, reverse the gay policy and then act like we should be grateful that they reversed it, I for me it's like. <laughs> It just feel it, it hurts because it just feels like, no, I, you know how hard it was for me to rationalize that and how hard it was for me to, and I made sense of it and made that okay in my mind. And now, now you're saying you're tr- just like, kidding. So now I feel like I, like I betrayed myself. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I mean, so those feelings are, and I feel that way with a lot of different things that they've done and they're just kidding. It's fine. It's like, I should be happy. And I guess I am that it's changing, but it also feels like a s- stab in the, a little bit it's mm-hmm. just like how can you just <laughs> you hurt people you hurt me a lot and you just act like it didn't happen and it's that's, been, that's like been the hardest part for me it's a little bit it feels some people feel gaslit you know yeah. it's just like very much so. changing the church no apologies everything's fine what's just the problem kind of sneak the essays in without even putting dates on them and just slide them in there pretend like they've always been there like they've always been there yeah, yeah. change the title page of the you know, Book of Mormon, like we said, change policies and act like we should be happy. It's just like, wait, let's talk about why I was even there in the first place. And, yeah. So what about the the grieving process? Like you, you talked to touch on it a bit, but just the anger, the remorse. It's like, I'm sure you guys paid a little bit of tithing. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, you you didn't listen to yourself. Yeah, you subjugated exactly. yourself to the patriarchy. You talked about maybe college or career, you know, other things you would have done. Like, have you guys had to deal with anger? And if so, how have you dealt with it? Yeah. And, and of course, you know, Alyssa, with, with your husband and the marriage and rushing into a, mm-hmm. a marriage too quickly and, and suffering at the hands of a abusive spouse, you know, how have you guys dealt with that? Definitely had my angry streaks, <laughs> and I, I, the whole stages of grief. I mean, it's like losing a loved one, losing your faith, and so I feel like I've gone through the stages multiple times. I feel like I think I'm through the anger, everything's good, I'm feeling good, all right, I'm thriving, I'm enjoying, you know, and then something will trigger, and I'm like, where'd this anger come from again? <laughs> I think there's just a lot of you know, resentment that gets built up that you don't even realize is there until, so, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a process. I think the grief process will be, I feel like I've come a long way, but it's not over. Listen. Yeah. And I think even though I left when I was young, um, you know, in my early twenties, it was still everything that I knew for my entire life. And it was still, I gave it everything I possibly had and I did everything to the fullest extent and then 10% more. Um, and so that was really hard because that was all I knew. And I, I was angry. I was angry about, 
I was really angry about my parents being outside of my wedding and I was angry about the abuse of marriage and I was angry um, that I felt like I had to explain it all away and I spent a long time in my childhood um, kind of just assuming that that one day I would find a man and he would be able to protect me. And so I think there were a lot of, and even though some of those messages were more implicit from leaders than explicit, um, and my parents tried to give me the opposite message a lot of times, I think there was a lot of time when I, you know, just expected that I, to ful to go into a role and I didn't really consider anything else. And so like when I left, I hadn't really given serious thought to a career. I hadn't even given real serious thought to myself, which was scary and that was hard and I was mad that I hadn't learned about, you know, sex ed when I was 13. Instead, I'd have to like learn about it after abuse and things like this and that was really frustrating. Dave, you want to pile on? <laughs> you had to do um, some grieving or not so much? I don't think I went through as much grieving as, as Carrie and Alyssa did. That's because the church is made for us. Yeah. Exactly. Right? I, mean, I think we got the good end of the deal. <laughs> it is. Um, you know, I, I don't mean to joke about that. No, it's, no. No, it's true, though. You know, there's things that uh, I look back and, and, and think I could have done things different. Um, but I hate to play that game because I don't know how things would be if I did anything different. Um, you know, I look back at um, just years of growing up, and and uh, we didn't do family, or you know, we would never go out to restaurants as a family on Sunday. Um, you know, maybe we could have had some some good times, and if we would have had a little bit more latitude on on things like that. Um, but like I say, um, you know, I can't look back and wish things were different. So I just try to look forward and, and, uh, you know, every once in a while I'll read an article about something that's going on in the church and I'll look at comments and I get a little bit frustrated, you know, thinking, you know, I roll my eyes and, and get a little bit frustrated at, at the way some people look at things, but. I'm guessing they probably get frustrated at the way I look at things. So, um, no, I think I've I've actually been okay. So, um, in what you, you've touched on this a little bit, uh, Carrie, but in what ways are things better? So, like, how is your individual health better, worse, the same? How's your marriage? Your marriage? How's your marriage? How's the overall family dynamic? Anything you guys want to add about how things might be better or even better than you thought they could be? So I just want to mention one thing as far as the anger thing real quick. Um, Alyssa's situation is probably the thing that, uh, that was the most frustrating for me. I mean, it's there's things that, you know, I can't entirely blame the church, but I mean... You know, so I'm not. I, I didn't mention that before because I'm, I'm. I'm not looking at everything that she went through as a church thing. I mean, there's um, some individual issues that there's jerks outside the church too, right? Right. right. But right. I'm just saying that. But yeah, that certain things exacerbated uh, that situation. That gets my blood pressure up uh, really fast. There's things that that you know, as a father, that's very stressful. Um. Anyway, but. I guess since I'm talking, I'll just keep going and answer your question here. Um, for me, our marriage is awesome. Um, like it was already good, so it's kind of the same or? Better. I How mean, can it be better? Um, Wickedness never was happiness. You've, you've heard the scripture. I, I know. I don't, I don't know what the deal is. I guess that was wrong. But that was... <laughs> um, Carrie and I have... You know, I've, I've mentioned that, that we've always been able to talk, and we've always had a lot to talk about, but we have even more to talk about now. I mean, um, you know, we'll we'll read things together, and we'll discuss what we're reading, and we both have different opinions. And you know, there's sometimes we were having some discussions about uh, coming on coming on this podcast, and um, there's times when. I was wondering if we should be on Merge on a Tightrope instead of this one, but um, no, just, I, 
we, we, I think for the most part, um, both of us enjoy our conversations a lot. Um, I guess I'll let her speak for, for herself on that, but, um, it's, she's able to wear a lot more fun outfits now. <laughs> um, he means underwear. <laughs> You know, I I, I shouldn't I, speak. That, but <laughs> I, I but often people that. say being able to wear your own, choose your own underwear that can is, be nice. Yeah, right. And, and I think you know, I Carrie's a lot happier just because she's in her own skin now. I'm I'm a lot happier. I feel like um, I can be me. Yeah. I don't have to. You know, I, I mentioned that that I've always felt like if I'm around people that are doing what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing and I'm not feeling like I'm measuring up. Um, you know, there's a little bit of anxiety there. Now I don't feel that. Um, I mean, I honestly don't. I'm just, I'm, I'm a lot more relaxed. So I think my blood pressure has got to be better. So my health has got to be better. Um, I get weekends off and a 10% raise. <laughs> um, you know, life's things are good. Um, I'm going to ask this question to kind of both of you, but we'll let you start and then we want, I want you to take over. It, some could argue that leaving the church is a demotion for the man because in the patriarchy, we're, we have a higher status. And all of a sudden, if, if you leave the church and their feminist sensibilities uh, incorporated within that departure, then all of a sudden you don't have that superiority, you don't have that hearkening mandate and so like in some ways either she's elevated or you're demoted but you're certainly not over her anymore and I don't I don't mean to be flipping about that and maybe this isn't even a thing but did was it but I know for some men it's hard to let go of the patriarchy and I'm wondering if it was hard for you it took some adjustment um you know, Carrie's made it clear that uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're equals, <laughs> and 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 I can honor that. I appreciate that. You know, I I went through a lot of years. Alyssa mentioned that we'd have our nightly prayers, and and I was the one that selected the person to say that. You know, I I just kind of led the family, and um, I was used to being the leader of the family, and. Um, that was one of the first things that we kind of, even before I'd really consider us in a crisis, I started saying, can you just see if, can you just wait and see if someone volunteers? Can we just like, so I started saying, rather than say that, how about, can I just say, does anybody want to say the prayer? Mm. We're going to just do that. We're going to offer that first. And if nobody, then you can, you know, but I'm like, that was like yeah. this little tiny baby step of breaking that. But we're a team. Yeah. And so, um, just because it took some adjustment doesn't mean that it was a bad thing. Um, I'm. I would think it's a good I, thing. It is. He told me he re he he feels like he's married to the girl that he felt that he knew met in college. Now again, that's nice. So yeah, because I'm definitely more that way awesome. now than I've been for a long time. Yeah. So anything else you want to say about what's better, individually, um, collectively? I think I pretty much covered, covered it. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. I like being able to like I'll go volunteer where I want to and where I see a need and you know it, it, it's very fulfilling to have that freedom to give to charity where I where I want to where, what looks like a like a good need to me and not just where I'm told to do it and spend my volunteer time where I want to spend it and like the open stores foundation exactly, for example exactly, exactly. <laughs> I didn't mention this but Carrie's on our I don't know if you want me to say this yeah, but Carrie's fine. on our board of directors so Carrie and, and Clint Martin are, are on the board of directors, and it's been an amazing year. Yeah, uh, one of the best years ever, probably the best year ever. So we're super grateful to have you. No, <laughs> I can I'm, tell you that. Well, good. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> so, no, I think that pretty much covers it. Just feel authentic, feel like I can, like I said, be myself and be more myself than I've been in a long time. So. Alyssa, you, you dealt with a lot of perfectionism and anxiety and you know, a tough marriage, like how are things for you individually and in your marriage and emotionally and all that stuff? Yeah, um, a lot better. I mean, I think perfectionism and anxiety is still a part of my life and I think it probably always will be, but it's really refreshing to not have um, 
this outside layer that's propelling that and is telling me that those feelings are good. And I think that was something that I kind of struggled with in the church was, um, you know, I'd learn at church, read your scriptures more, do more things, do more things, do more things. And my parents would always say, how about you just do the opposite of what they say? <laughs> because you're so like high strung that your personality needs the opposite. And I always felt a little bit guilty in the church setting of uh, feeling like I well, should do the opposite. In our defense, <laughs> I'd say that about school, too. I'd no, say definitely. When they're pushing homework, you need to do the opposite. So it wasn't just church, but yeah. <laughs> but it was it was like they're propelling anxiety, do the opposite so you can diminish anxiety. And I right. think in a church setting, that felt made me feel guilty. And so it's really nice to be able to take that shame off. Um, and I think that's something I'm still working through. I think I still have a lot of Mormon shame pent up in there. So keep on working through that. <laughs> Um, but it is like, extremely liberating, and I think it's been amazing for me to feel like I can actually ask myself what I want to do. And I can have conversations with Kate about how we want our future to look. And that's kind of scary at first, but it's been really healthy for us to be kind of have an open slate. And instead of knowing that he's going to, he has to find the best job ever so that I can stay home, we can both find things that we like and we can supplement each other. And I think that's been a really healthy way for us to be able to find a balance. And I think it takes the pressure off of him and it takes the pressure off of me and it's letting us both kind of live our authenticity a little bit more. And that's been really healthy. <laughs> and any, any, any guys want to speak for Kendall, how she's doing? <laughs> <laughs> she seems to be doing great from, from my observations. You agree? <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah. She's happy. She's a happy kid, but yeah, she seems to be. She graduates. And she graduates with in May. Undergrad in May. I graduate with my master's in May. And Kate, Kate graduates, graduates with his undergrad in May, so we're gonna have a big party in May. But yeah, Kendall seems to be doing well. She's. She's really good at just kind of going with the flow. She's a very adaptable girl. So. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> I guess we're kind of coming to the end. So, is there any? You know, there are different things that we have done to kind of end advice for people. Uh, you've given some of that already, but also kind of your testimony now or what you believe now. Do you, you know, sometimes people want to know if you still believe in God, if you go to another church, if you still believe in Jesus, if you are godless atheists, like, you know, <laughs> like, and, and how you stay moral or what your life philosophy is. So I guess I can, I'll ask each of you to kind of like bring up whatever your closing, you want your closing statement to be. Okay. Is that all right? Sure. Yeah. And because we want to... S- oh, unless... Oh, and you're going to read. Letter to read, yeah. Okay, that can be yours, or we yeah, can do whatever. Okay. Thing, yeah. So what we'll do, Dave, any final things you want to say first? Sure. Because we want to save the best for last. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. She needs to close it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, when you asked me to do this, you know, it was... It was a tough decision, but I appreciate it um, because, you know, I still have people that I love dearly that are in the church, and I don't want to harm the church. And so that hasn't been my goal at all. My goal has just been to, to tell my story. Um, I'm grateful for my Mormon upbringing. Um, I'm grateful that my parents taught me the way they did. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity I have now to live my life uh, without the church. I, I feel like I've got a, a, a wonderful family. Um, we've always been a really close family. My mom's referred to our family as a, a Mary Poppins family she, because uh, we've always been able. We've always been close, and I think we're we're cl- just as close or closer than ever now. Um, I'm at peace with things. I, you know, it, it, this wasn't a, you know, being where I'm at was was not a light decision. Um, you know, I've I've emphasized that I understand the gravity of the situation, and I, you know, the responsibility for me to lead my family in my mind was was so great. I didn't want to do something that not only compromised my eternal salvation, but my family's. And so I, I certainly didn't take it lightly, but, um, you know, I didn't go through all the bullet items of all the things that, um, that I found, but, uh, there were numerous things and, and they've all been talked about on, on Mormon stories podcasts, but 
there's a lot of things that uh, um, that led me to where I'm at. But now that I'm at where I'm at, um, I'm happy. I mean, I, I can genuinely say I don't, I don't look back and feel like maybe I made a mistake. I'm, I'm not questioning it. Um, I'm trying things that I hadn't tried in the past. Um, I joined a book club, <laughs> awesome book club. Sounds dangerous. <laughs> um, I've actually <clears throat> gone to some karaoke parties that. Uh, <laughs> it's been a stretch. <laughs> and uh, you know, I've 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 been able to look at life with a different perspective. Um, Don't go too crazy. <laughs> I, I feel like. You know, I mentioned my perspective when we first got married about uh, about Carrie's family and how it was a little bit, um, you know, how I how casual I I felt like, um, you know, naive and casual. But I felt like uh, their decision to be outside the temple was their decision, um, and now I I have a completely different perspective, um, and so I've. I'm I'm really appreciating this new perspective on things. I, I feel like I'm a lot more, um, a lot more. I think I'm just a better person. Honestly, I feel like, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not judgmental, um, and I didn't realize how judgmental I was before. But anyway, um, I I'm really happy with how things are, and I've. I've you know, I'd look forward to the rest of my life. Nice. Oh, I, as far as my other beliefs, um, I, I do believe in God. Um, I know that's one of the things that a lot of people um, lose when they leave the church because you pretty much have to deconstruct everything. Um, I, you know, I won't go into all the details, but I just feel like there's just so many systems in place that uh, there's a lot of strong evidence that you know, for me, that uh, the the God that I believe in now um, may not be the God that Joseph Smith described. Uh, he or she may not like, look like a human. It might be a force. I'm just saying that and he may or may not be involved in my life as much as I used to think that he was. Um, but there's just things that um, that that have just led me to believe that this is what we have has got to be done by design. I think what I'll, I'm going to give you one example. Um, and I realize that everybody's got different opinions on things, but just to really quickly give you one example, you know, I look at, uh, you know, if, at, at, at the, the big bang, um, you know, it may have been an accident. It may, it may have been intentional, whatever. Um, Anyway, bottom line is we end up with some living organisms. And, uh, you know, for me, you know, having this desolate earth and having some living or organisms that survive, um, I can't even keep a plant alive. And so to have, have things just continue to grow and grow and, yeah. and, and turn into what we have now um, just feels like it has to be something more than just chance. And let's say we have... Um, you know, humans on Earth and everything's, you've got all the systems in place, you've got the reproduction, reproductive system in place. You know, I've told Carrie that, you know, we wouldn't have kids unless I had this, this God-given attraction to my wife. You know, even if we had all the facilities to have kids, you've got to have the attraction. And, there, and what I'm saying is, for me, there's just a lot of things that, that lead me to believe that there's just, there's got to be something. But, but you know, I'm also open to the, the idea that I've missed the boat there too because I've been wrong before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, so maybe you will see your family again. I, I hope so. I I don't think that the church is the will be the the vehicle that would do it, but uh, um, you know, I I certainly have hopes to see my family again. So you're keeping that you're keeping that eternal family's part. <laughs> I am. That's good. Keep the good, right? <laughs> I'm keeping the good. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dave. Well, thank you, Carrie. Well, I think I kind of covered it a little okay. bit before. Yeah. Um, as far as the God question, for me, um, it's trying to make sense of why, and this may just be that God is something different than the Mormon God, but according to the Mormon God, I can pray 
and he will help me find my keys. He will comfort me if I'm stressed about a test or whatever, but yet the, the things that, the, the number of children that have died since we've been talking in the world is, and I just, I can't, I can't make sense of that. I can't, um, and the whole free agency thing just doesn't, it just doesn't, it doesn't ring true to me. So it's easier for me to believe that there isn't one than there's one that would do that. Um, but again, I'm kind of in the headspace of I don't know, and I like that I don't know because then I'm not um, bound to one, you know, particular thought. So it's nice for me to be able to my thoughts kind of ebb and flow a little bit, and we'll see where it goes. Right now, I'm just comfortable saying I don't know, and I'm happy, and life is good. So. I don't have to know. So. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. All right, Alyssa, bring us home. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so I have this letter that I'll read that I wrote to my parents. Um, I would just want to reiterate really quickly that this is just my experience, and this is not an experience of like anybody in my family or anybody else, but just me and just what I feel like is the best for my journey. Um, so it just kind of is a quick synopsis, I guess, of where I've been and where I am now. And so if you don't like listening to reading, you can just turn it off now, I guess. <laughs> don't go away. Don't. don't it's so She's good. She's an amazing writer. <laughs> so you want to stay tuned for the big finish. Here we go. <laughs> Take it away, Alyssa. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> um, you push it forward. If you want. Forward. Okay. Dear Mom and Dad, on June 22nd, 2016, a bishop told me that it was risky to trust you because you were less active in church. On June 22nd, 2016, I put my face in my hands and told the bishop that I felt unsafe. His response was asking whether or not I was consistently reading my scriptures and praying, both of which I was doing almost obsessively. On June 22nd, 2016, a bishop clarified my fear by reiterating that the temple teaches that the man is the head of the household. On that same day, I started to tell a bishop what was happening in my own home, but he cut me off to tell me that he'd already heard a different story. He indicated that my narrative didn't matter. It was up to me to decide that I didn't have to believe the story my bishop tried to create for me. On June 22, 2016, I left the office of a man I was taught to respect, realizing that although he should have been called of God and should have the spirit of discernment, I couldn't trust him. I got into my car and didn't go home. On June 22, 2016, I decided to leave a relationship that was increasingly becoming dangerous to me emotionally, spiritually, and physically. During the summer of 2017, I laid a paper with a checklist of questions about the church, ranging from history to social issues, on my stake president's desk. All of my questions were color-coded according to severity, and although he tried to provide me with good answers, I had a rebuttal for every justification he made. I was desperately hoping he would make me feel better, hoping he would have an answer to my thorough prodding. He didn't. Although he was kind and to this day I respect him, he warned Kate about me. Because I asked questions, he marked me as unsafe. Contrary to my strength in 2016, in the summer of 2017, I left an office clutching a wrinkled piece of paper with unanswered questions, thinking I had to conform to someone else's box to be truly happy. For the next six months, I squeezed myself into the box, vaguely aware that I might not be able to stay there forever, vaguely aware that someday I would have to break out. During the summer of 2017, that same stake president challenged me to go to the temple again to get over my fear. I invited my roommate to go with me, but the day came and I sat on the floor of my room crying and shaking because I didn't want to go. During the summer of 2017, I rescheduled to go with her, going multiple times, praying that I would find solace there even though I never did. That summer, I thought about walking away from the temple and the church, but I was too scared of the consequences. That summer, I stayed even though I knew that the church was hurting me. In June 2018, I left what some people call the covenant path by taking off my garments. In some ways, garments felt like a safety net. People didn't suspect my loss of faith when they saw the lines in the middle of my legs. It kept me part of a tribe, but I stopped wearing them because I couldn't keep holding a lie so close to my body. June 21st, 2019 was a summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the day with the most light. It is the marker of summer. It is the marker of change. For me, it was a day that the past three and a half years led up to. It was a day where after years of questioning, leaving, and resolving, I had the most light daylight of any day of the year to pause and see if I truly wanted to embrace the change that had been coming. 
Most members of the church associate the church with light, but for me, vulnerability and authenticity are brighter. On the longest day of the year, the day before change, I decided how I wanted to pursue light. On June 22nd, 2019, I left officially the thing I'd held on to the longest. I submitted my resignation to the church. In January of 2019, I knew I wanted to resign, but I decided to hold off a while to ensure that what I was choosing was really what I wanted. I didn't want to leave out of spite or anger or frustration at a specific talk or doctrine. So I sat for about six months, seriously contemplating just quickly removing my records multiple times, but I never did. On June 22nd, 2019, I didn't, believe be I didn't leave because of the solstice or the bishop or an unhealthy relationship. I didn't leave because I was mad or because I felt influenced by you or because I felt rebellious to hit the submit button. I didn't leave because I disliked the culture or because I was trying to prove a point to people who are still in or because I hated the history of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young or because I no longer believed the Book of Mormon to be an ancient text or because I learned Masonic roots of temple ordinances or because you were kept out of my wedding. I didn't even choose to resign because I learned the church isn't true. I left because, for me, the church did more harm than good, and I am strong enough to step away from things that cause me pain. I have learned over the years that I am strong enough to pry myself away from things that hurt me, even if I love them. Not because I'm offended, but because I can love myself and take care of myself and not revel in self-pain. That's why I'm sitting here and drinking an almond milk latte with lavender and splitting a lavender lemon scone with my love, Cade. Even though these treats make me uncomfortable and it would be less scary to just have something with zero calories that are delicious. I choose to take care of me. I choose to push myself into spaces that will help with my progress, even if those spaces are unknown. I choose to prioritize moments with those I care about more than what I'm scared of. I'm writing you a formal letter because I don't want leaving something that was such a huge part of my life to be a casual conversation topic or a quick click or a flippant decision. I've debated for a long time whether resigning was necessary. Would it be more balanced to just walk away informally and silently? Eventually, I decided that formally resigning would be the best form of growth for me personally. It doesn't have to be the choice for everyone who walks away from the church, but it was mine. And to add ceremony to my decision, I submitted my resignation at Westside Coffee, a place that I felt calmness and spirituality apart from the Mormon religion. I love you both very much. Thank you for supporting me. Beautiful. Huh? Well written. Yeah. <laughs> well... That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Any, anything you want to end with that, or did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, that's basically all I have to say. <laughs> okay. She basically, she be, I'm going to change it to me. She basically just dropped the mic. <laughs> <laughs> the mic. She dropped the mic. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're back. Well, we did it. We made it through. Right. Looks like it's about six hours, maybe six and a half. I don't know, but <laughs> went by fast. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much for your courage and your willing, your vulnerability and your authenticity. And I know it's going to help a lot of people. So many important themes. Kate's here. Kate, thanks for everything. I was I was telling uh, Kate at dinner just how nice it is for a father to have a young man come in to your daughter's life and help be a part of her healing. It is. And uh, that's what Jeff has been to my daughter Maya. And that's what I think Kate has been to Alyssa. So kudos to you, Kate, <laughs> off camera. And uh, yeah, in Alyssa, you're a warrior and a champion and super resilient. So Thank you. we want to follow all your good things. Will you stay in touch? And <laughs> yeah, for sure. Let us know all the good things that are happening. Lots of positive comments. I'm not going to read them, but you can come back and read them later. People loved your essay. That's and so good, uh, huh? and and. You know, Dave and Carrie, it's just such a pleasure to be your friend and to know you guys. And good job. Well, thank you. Keep it thank up. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks, All right. So, listeners, thanks for joining us, those who tuned in. Uh, thanks for everyone who's listening on YouTube or Facebook or whatever. Thanks uh, for supporting Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. If you enjoy this uh, programming, if you want to see continue, uh, and you feel comfortable or moved to, we would love to get your support because it's the only way we can have this studio and pay for these facilities and, and uh, make it all happen is through the support. So thanks to Carrie for serving on the Open Stories Foundation board. Thanks to uh, Tyler and, and Cody who helped make this possible, Clint and others. But also thanks to all our donors. And if you want to support uh, Mormon Stories, please 
go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, and um, become a monthly subscriber. And, and we'll do this for as long as you guys are willing to support it. So please support us if you can. And if you already do, thank you so much. Please spread the word. And if you love this episode, please share it with people you think it might be useful to. And most importantly, just uh, keep on healing and growing. Um, for those who don't know, uh, there is going to be a Thrive event, I think, February 1st in in Phoenix. For those of you who want to go to Phoenix and meet with some people, you can go to thrivebeyondmormonism.com and learn about that event. There's also going to be a Thrive Chicago in April. Um, for those who want to come to that, I'll be coming to Chicago for that one. Um, and uh, we just are excited to encourage progressive and post-Mormons to learn and heal and grow. And so that's your job. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>